We're gonna go over the, the options for tensioning high lines, but also really this whole concern about rope grabs and like the traits that we want and the dangers that people feel when using them. We talk about uh, some things might break the rope. We have to know what we're doing really. So we're gonna test both of these devices out. And there are other videos out there where, yeah, they tested the old rescue sender, it slipped, they tested the new one. Okay, it broke at a lot of force. And then they tested this and it slipped at relatively low force. And all those were in a controlled environment, more or less, with a pull machine that was a consistent rate. We're gonna try to do like some quasi field testing where we're simulating, okay, what would be like tensioning with like a haul team. Then we're gonna maybe just start oscillating the line, the track line of a high line to see the effect of the tension through the uh, rope grabs and to see if they hold to where we want them to. We'll go over all the different high line tensioning options after we test these. We'll whiteboard it out. We'll talk about safety factors, the little nuances of minutia. And so our test for this is just to simulate this grabbing a rope. It's anchored, but the load cell is here. Granted, like it's not a full rescue load. It's not even a one kilonewton single person load. It's 90 pounds. It just adds a little bit of weight. We can get to our numbers a lot faster. I want to isolate completely the rope grab from anything else to include progress captures like maestros anything that will slip so i want that to be completely isolated so we terminate our line with a bowline, line and then we put our tensioning system this is a 36 to 1 it's a three on three on four compound 36 to 1 mechanical advantage cool okay gris go ahead and start pulling okay right there it's starting to slip so around 1300 1350 just oscillate it with your hand. So we're gonna simulate maybe a jerky pull with the control lines fore and aft and see what happens with our forces, see if they spike at all. Yeah, bounce on that. And we aren't really getting a whole lot more as far as spikes. Again, this will, it'll still slip when it hits like that 1300 pound mark. All right, that's good enough. Okay, so that was pretty good representation of like a jerky pull or like a, a fighting control lines on each side or if like there's a rescuer bouncing on the line. The way it's kind of at the midpoint. So this thing does slip right around 1,300 pounds. Uh, we'll go over what that means for us, whether we like that or not later. Uh, let's switch that up and let's do the rescue center. Right. So right now when we're tensioning, we're getting max force. And then when we stop, it dials back down by about... 500 pounds. Right now we're at 15. Okay, there was some motion here in the rope at 1975, so about 2,000 pounds. Okay, right there. That started to slip. 2,200 pounds. Pull, like reset and pull just a little bit more, but very slowly, okay? So right there is where it pinched. But you can see there's a little bit of deformation right there on that initial slip. So somebody's got to be watching this. I'd say 2,000 pounds is probably like our limit. 2,500 right there. So we're holding at 2,500 pounds. Okay, stop. We weren't gonna go forward any more than that. Uh, we had an initial slip, but it was very subtle. There you go, Cam. So on the rescue sender, granted, they aren't, they aren't devices that are designed or I'd say certified. They aren't certified, tested to slip. Give it a, a bigger spike. No, it's still holding and we spiked it to from 23 to 2500 so no major like significant like oscillations when it bounces like that if there's a jerky control line movement or if the rescuer is actually on the as the package manipulating it standing on litters or whatever there's not a huge difference in the oscillating forces the spikes aren't significant okay yeah. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Uh, what, what I could see through the rescue center after the slip was this curvature here. Uh, but again, like once we cross over 2,000 pounds, definitely some core or some sheath, complete damage to the sheath. This rope is out of service. The core strands are exposed, didn't fail, but that's permanent. That's permanent damage. So the rope, at least from here forward, is done with the rescue center. The CMC Capto, yeah, it did slip under what we would call slow pull applications to tension high lines at six kilonewtons or 1,350 pound force. <clears throat> the rescue center, the new ones, did not slip. So at 1,800 pounds, there was some damage starting to occur. Cameraman noticed that, but we didn't actually get 
what we thought was a slip was actually really just the rope de-sheathing. Anywhere between 8 to 11 is like danger zone for the rescue sender on a slow pull application. For both devices, what we saw was that as they were holding, the oscillation didn't really have a major impact on force amplification spikes. Why do we care? Like, we were tensioning high lines. We weren't like putting these in a hall system. If you're using these, just do it responsibly. And if you're pushing like the, the bell curve and you're, and you're operating kind of on that gray area, uh, you have to be a lot more dialed than this. Uh, and one of the ways which we can be dialed is one, when we're, when we're tensioning high lines in that application, is get a load cell. If you're like a serious organization and you want the high line thing in your toolbox, throw in a load cell in your toolbox too, because then at least you, you can keep track of forces a whole lot easier and you're not just flying blind. Having the load cell is like for the fire types, like the engineer types, like having like a flow meter, trying to pump water on a fire, like all the nozzles are designed to allow for a certain flow rate in gallons per minute and we have to do all this math in order to get the right pressure to pump to meet that flow. So the load cell is like the number, we just watch the number based on a few criteria that we already know. We just, we know the strength of our ropes. Uh, we don't want to go beyond certain safety factors and we know the limitations of our rope grabs. We just want to make sure that we're, we're using these responsibly. Let's segue into just high line tensioning. Why do we do high lines? Uh, really it's to move something from point A to point B across some horizontal span. It doesn't have to be horizontal. It can be like sloping or steep, but Either way, you're, you're, there's a horizontal element. And granted, offsets would solve a lot of high line problems where you, you don't have to do high lines, but if you are gonna have high lines in your toolbox, we do them to maximize clearance or height above a hazard or obstruction. And in doing and such, we wanna eliminate like the sag. So 11 millimeters, 7 16th rope at 40 kN, 9,000 pounds. We do a 10 to one static system. Sorry. Let's not do static system. Let's just do static safety factor, not system safety factor, because we aren't talking about control lines here. 10 to one safety factor. Where that comes from, like there are other, I talk about this in other videos, uh, but people seem to always want to like adhere to this. Do you have to? No, in high lines, I don't think you have to. The 10 to one safety factor gives you a max of four kilonewtons or 900 pounds of force. What that equates to in a practical sense is if we take our worst case scenario, really, we, when we're doing highlines, we don't want to put any more than two people max. So that's a two kilonewton load at four, 450 pounds. This is that at 150 degree catenary angle. Like, and that's reasonable, it's okay. Can we flatten that out even more? I'd say, yeah. Am I comfortable going to a five to one safety factor, cutting that in half and going, eight kilonewtons of tension in my track line, uh, which is 1,800 pounds. Yes and no, I have to know what I'm doing now. So we tested out the rescue center and we said oh, on a single line, 1,800 pounds, we're starting to create damage. We don't wanna go beyond that. Not to say we can't use a rescue center, but like that's like a last ditch option. We can't use a CAPTA because if I want to operate at eight kilonewtons with a single line, the CAPTA is gonna slip. So where, what am I left with? Well, I can double my ropes and split the difference on the rope grabs. That's probably the best way to do it because I inherently, for the whole system, I increase my safety factors that way. Or maybe I could press my luck with tandem pressix as a rope grab. But I am comfortable operating a high line at five to one. Again, like we're, we're concerned about things failing, uh, but we haven't even talked about our, our control line system. That's the belay for a failing track line. So we're our, if we rig that into the equation, we're covered but we still want to be prudent. What this five to one safety factor, eight kilonewtons, 1800 pounds of tension, and a single rope uh, that has a 40 kilonewton or breaking strength, what that equates to in a practical sense is your same rescue load, two kilonewtons, 450 pounds at 165 instead of a 150 catenary. So we're flattening that out. Again, we can achieve this with less force in each line with a minimal sag by doubling our ropes up and we can use either Three to one safety factor. This is where I kind of don't want to be, <laughs> on a, especially on a single rope, but like, it's not going to happen anyway. Like your rope may be a tandem press, like, but you're really kind of pushing the limits here on a three to one safety factor. That equates to 
13 kilonewtons, or 3,000 pounds. This would be like your same rescue load, two-person rescue load, at a 170-degree catenary angle. If I'm doing that, and we've done this, uh, but we've done it with two ropes. See it in a different setup. I talked about the catenary angle. So this is a visual. So 150 degrees, two-person rescue load gives you 900 pounds. Uh, 160, same thing, gives you 1350. This is the slip threshold for the Capto, 160, and a single line. That's, you're gonna start slipping uh, with a Capto. With, with a rescue sender, you're not. So this would be okay with a rescue sender. Uh, this would be okay with a rescue sender or Capto. And then here, like, I don't wanna really, I'd be pushing it with a rescue sender. I'd rather just do two lines with a rescue sender. Two lines with a Capto here at 165, I'm approaching that slip value. So two rescue senders, yes, one rescue sender, you're really pushing your luck. Okay, 170. 170 two-person rescue load, 2,700 pounds. Absolutely gonna want two track lines instead of a single track line. If I do two track lines, I can drop that down. Each track line has six kilonewtons on one, six kilonewtons on another. Captos won't work. A pair of rescue senders will still work there. And we've done this before and been just fine. Uh, again, oscillating forces, not a huge concern. But the effects of all that, uh, 150 degree res two person rescue load, you get two times the force amplification. That gives you a 10 to one safety factor, 160 degrees rescue load, two person rescue load, three times a 300% force amplification gives you a seven to one, 165 catenary angle with a two person rescue load gives you 400% or four times the amplification in a track line, that gives you a five to one and then so on and so forth. 600% or six times at 170 degrees gives you a three to one safety factor. So just another way to visualize that over there if, if your brain processes it differently. Okay, so do we care like tensioning, going back up to tensioning, do we care about the tensioning rules? And this applies if you don't have a load cell. Yeah, all these rules, rule of 12, rule of 18, the 10% sag rule, visual sag de deflection, really hard to get in real life. Just get yourself a, re a load cell and eliminate all that and just stick to watching your numbers on your load cell based off of the strength of your rope and your safety factors and then knowing what rope grabs are gonna be appropriate for that sort of system. Okay, moving on. Let's go take a look at how we actually tension high lines. Okay, so we're gonna go through four scenarios or four different like configurations. We're gonna break them down categorically into two different, two different types. One is the tensioning system is the same line as the track line. So this implies that it's just a single line that we're working with. The classic being like we do a high strength tie off on the far end and we do a three to one Z rig with the rope and we have the rope grab here. Okay, as we're hauling, the rope grab is only gonna see two thirds of the total force in this. Because if you do like the T method, or if you look at it, it's a simple mechanical advantage, 33%, 33%, and 33%, or one third, one third, one third. So one third, one third here to the pulley, to the rope grab is two thirds during the haul. The second we stop, the rope grab sees nothing, and then everything is on the maestro, which does slip around eight, I believe, eight kilonewtons. How can we do a dual track high line with one rope Basically, we send a bite over to the far side. So we, we start off on the near side, high strength tie off with the terminal end, we send the bite over, and we rig it to a far side anchor with a pulley. Now, the connections and everything here have to be really, really strong, as well as the anchor, because we're doubling, we're putting a 200% force amplification on this anchor point, or a series of anchors and the components. So we send the bite over, the bite comes back to us through the maestro, and then we rig the three to one as we normally would up here. Okay, same thing. The rope grab would see two thirds of the total tension in a single line during the haul. And the second we stop hauling, the rope grab sees nothing and it's all on the maestro. But this tension on the maestro is here and then it's the same tension here. So if this is the same anchor again, it's twice the force that you're gonna see. Each strand is at a three to one. So there's a net six to one effect on that far side anchor through that pulley. That was how to do high line tensioning with a single line where the line is the tensioning system. Let's separate it out. We're doing dual track lines when we separate it out and we have a separate line for the tensioning system and a separate system of track lines. So the classic one that you'd see in a book or whatever is where we high strength tie off with our tensioning line Route it up, this is a two to one. We change the direction, we do another two to one. This is all anchored here. Our load cell is placed at that, if you wanna call it a differential, you can. 
we center it here on the load cell and then we come through the maestro. We do the three to one on the maestro. That gives us a six to one on, on the rope grab that's holding tension here and a six to one on the rope grab that's holding tension on the other one. So the net effect for the whole track line system for the pair at the far side anchors is basically 12 to one uh, mechanical advantage here. We put a load cell here. When we put a load cell here at the center at the differential at the anchor that doesn't move, this will read the total tension in one line. So whatever you're reading on the load cell is the tension in the one line, which should match the tension in the other line because of the way this is. In theory, right? We're disregarding friction through the pulleys. Okay, so if we're doing dual tracks, again, going back to that, uh, our safety factors and how we on, want to operate, I'm perfectly comfortable putting rescue cinders here and here. I just watch my load cell and make sure that I'm nowhere near like hitting that 1800 pounds of force or eight kilonewtons. Here, as opposed to the single track, we, the rope grabs are assuming 100% of the tension in the track lines at all times, regardless of where we stop or, or, or start. Unlike the single track line over here where we said that it was two thirds during the haul, and when we stopped and the load captured, the rope grab was not seeing anything, you could derig that if you wanted to, and everything will be here on the anchor. Not the case here. Rope grabs are assuming the entire force of the track lines at all times, 100%. Sometimes slip is good, but sometimes we don't want the slip. In this case, I'd probably say that we don't want the slip if we know what we're doing, and we don't want to lose the, lose the height, and we don't want them to sag too much. I would put rescue centers in here. This one down here is also a dual track, but instead of using one line and compounding mechanical advantage, we take the terminal end of our tensioning system, high strength, high off, comes up through a two to one, rig that in there, comes down this, where this would be at the anchor here, we're just gonna throw in a set of fours between it, and then it goes to the second two to one, and then we terminate. So no maestro here, it just terminates, terminates, and it's a fixed line. But we, bring, we, we collapse that fixed line with our set of fours in a five to one configuration, we put the load cell here, and we collapse everything. Again, the same thing applies. A little bit different this time, it's not a six to one on each as it is here, it's a five to one on each track line for a net effect at the far side anchor system of 10 to one. Just another way to do it. That wraps up like the configurations, our options. Do we care about a slip characteristic for the rope grab and are we worried about overloading? Well, if you don't know what you're doing, yeah, you should be over worried about overloading. But if you don't know what you're doing, you shouldn't do high lines, especially if you don't have a load cell. If you don't have a load cell, uh, you're really <laughs> hanging it out there. It's tough to keep track of everything you're doing here. So things you can do, double up your ropes or have more than one track line, minimize the load, try to keep one person as the load. Sometimes that's unavoidable and get a load cell. I think it's also worth mentioning, I didn't really talk about it yet, maybe because they're dinosaurs, but the old rescue sender that was discontinued sometime around 2016. Delaney did the test on this and this one actually did slip on a slow pull at around eight kilonewtons. So as cumbersome as these were and people didn't like them because of the pens, like the one trait <laughs> that, that we lost uh, when, we, when they went away from the old ones and went to the new ones was that the new ones no longer provided the added benefit of slipping at those target loads, that eight kilonewton range. If you still have the old ones, it might be worth keeping them in your inventory uh, as an option. Okay, to summarize. So on the spectrum, just, I didn't do the tandem prussix. Now there's enough testing that's been done on that, but it seems like the old rescue center is a sweet spot based on Delaney's testing where it slips at higher values, whereas the new rescue center would de-sheet the rope and the capto doesn't want to hold tension to those higher values that I'd want in a high line, possibly. So this won't hold higher values, but will slip. This will hold higher values, but it will de-sheath the rope. And this holds higher values and will slip. One last thing that we do need to cover about the capto, which I found interesting. On the back, it says that it, it's classified as a rope grab, a general use, general use rope grab for NFPA they need to hold for 30 seconds the test load and the test load for general use rope grabs is 11 kilonewtons or 2,500 pounds. That, that's the force at which the rescue center broke or de-sheathed the rope. This thing didn't even come close. It's not a big deal, I don't care, but like just to label something that's not accurate is kind of concerning. Unless somebody can prove me wrong, like I don't know 
unless it unless you actually pull that slow at one inch per minute i don't know under what environmental conditions so there you have it